Hello, my name is Neil Cleese. I'm a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and this is the fourth in a series of occasional lectures on selected topics in Polish and Polish American history that I've been invited to give by the Polish Center of Wisconsin in Franklin, Wisconsin. And the topic that I want to talk about today, as you see in the slide, is the mighty son of Poland, Stanislaw Zbyszko, Polish Americans, and sport in the early 20th century. And as always, I should begin by saying that any of the opinions that I express in this lecture are mine and do not necessarily represent the opinions of the Polish Center of Wisconsin. Now, up till now, um, I've been talking about pretty weighty and serious subjects, but history doesn't always have to be about kings and battles and revolutions, and sometimes it can cover the lighter side of uh, life as well. And I've always had a, a sort of side interest in the history of sport, not so much what actually happens on the field, which which you know, classifies as entertainment, but sport insofar as it touches what you might call real life. Uh, you know, it, it can have to do with politics or society or, or, or just the way that uh, uh, people live their everyday lives as uh, amusements or, or, or the like. And in particular, I've always had an interest in sport as a means by which immigrants, you know, people coming into the United States from foreign countries, it kind of can serve as an introduction to the, the, the customs and folkways of American life. And that includes the people who came to the United States from the Polish lands. And one thing that you notice in the history of sport and its relationship to uh, immigrants and immigration is that uh, in the early 20th century, immigrant groups often adopted uh, an athlete of their heritage as a sort of ethnic sporting hero. That is somebody, an accomplished athlete whose accomplishments could kind of show that their boys could make it in American society. And uh, they, they served as a kind of promise of, of, of their advancement uh, uh, up the ladder of, of uh, American status. Now, now, probably the best known example of an ethnic sporting hero in all of American history is uh, uh, the figure you see on the lower right here, uh, uh, the baseball player Jackie Robinson. Now, yeah, he's not. He doesn't exactly qualify as an immigrant, but you, you get the general idea. But if you take a look at the upper left, the two figures there, the baseball players, Hank Greenberg and Joe DiMaggio, certainly classified as ethnic sporting heroes for Jewish Americans and Italian Americans. Now, now when it comes to the American colonial. In the early 20th century, they chose a Polish-born wrestler who plied his sweaty trade under the name of uh, a pseudonym uh, of, of Stanislaus Zbyszko. Now, in a sense, this is kind of unusual because wrestling was not a sport that one associated with social advancement in the United States. It was a sport associated with the lower classes. And in a sense, the choice of a wrestler almost seemed as if it could confirm the, 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 the durable stereotype of Polish-American males as, as, as ruffians uh, with, with, with no breeding or education. But Stanislaw Zbyszko was not a brute. In fact, he was a man of parts, educated and refined. And because of this, he also left his mark on the realms of American literature and law and cinema, as well as sport. Now, those things 
we can verify. There were other stories told about his life and accomplishments as well. Legends and tall tales, you know, many told by Zbyszko himself. And these turn out on um, uh, close examination uh, either to be complete falsehoods or exaggerations with just a kernel of truth. But even without the fabrications, and in fact, actually, in part because of them, uh, his is one of the most fascinating biographies, I would say, in the entire annals of uh, sport. Now, by the turn of the 20th century, wrestling had emerged from uh, disrepute and low regard, and it was coming into its own as a spectator sport in the United States, and came to occupy a secure, if relatively minor, niche in uh, 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 the, the, the athletic landscape of, of the United States. Now, Zbyszko competed long enough to witness and to participate in the transformation of wrestling from a legitimate sport to a spectacle more resembling show business with uh, fixed results and predetermined outcomes. Uh, and this is how we regard professional wrestling now, uh, as sort of pseudo-sport. But in his days, Bishko became uh, the sort of unlikely spokesman for, um, uh, for protest against the lost innocence of his calling. And that in itself is sort of an interesting, if unlikely, story. Now, where does it all begin? Um, the future Zbyszko was born under the name Stanisław Jan Siganiewicz, the son of, a, of modest but respectable Polish parents uh, who dwelt in the Austrian ruled zone of then partitioned Poland. Um, his uh, protean strength uh, became quickly evident. He worked as a circus strongman. And then he went into wrestling, and after completing a certain degree of uh, higher education and mandatory military service for uh, Austria-Hungary, he went into professional wrestling full time. Now, uh, by 1904, uh, he entered uh, the, the European professional wrestling circuit, and he adopted the name Zbyszko and, uh, as a professional alias, and he took this after the hero of uh, the well-known no patriotic novel by uh, Polish writer Henryk Sienkiewicz, uh, The Teutonic Knights. And by 1906, uh, the date of the picture you see here, he had established, he had mainly uh, been based in London, and he had established a plausible, if not yet undisputed, claim uh, to the world championship of wrestling. Now, by 1909, uh, the date of, of, of roughly this photograph, uh, Zbyszko went to the United States of America, which was the obvious next career move. Uh, America was emerging as the largest world market for spectator sport, and in the United States itself, wrestling was entering a, a, a phase of popularity, especially among European immigrants, who, uh, such as the Polish Americans, who, who knew wrestling from the old world, whereas you know they didn't have much familiarity or uh, liking for the quote-unquote American sports, uh, such as baseball or football. Now, Zbyszko became an attraction uh, pretty much from the get-go uh, once he hit American shores. And above all, American commentators were struck by both his Polishness, this is, all, this is always commented on, and his sheer size and strength, uh, at which newspaper articles or uh, uh, sports writers constantly expressed amazement. And you can see typical photographs of uh, 
uh, of him here. Uh, he was routinely called the most muscularly developed athlete in the entire history of sport, and, and, and this continued. Descriptions of him along these lines uh, continued long after that was uh, no longer true, if it ever was. Uh, in fact, you know, his immensity was sort of illusory. And, um, uh, you know, opponents often outweighed him, uh, as in the example that you see here. You know, Zbyszko was no midget. He uh, uh, weighed about 275 pounds, was the figure that you usually found uh, quoted. But his actual secret was that he was, you know, he packed his 275 pounds uh, in, in a pretty short and stocky frame. Um, you know, he was officially listed as five foot eight inches tall. Uh, that was probably a stretch. Uh, and he had a very low center of gravity that made it uh, very difficult for taller opponents uh, to topple him in the ring. Now, there were other things that, uh, you know, drew attention to Zbyszko, and, and among them was the legend that he promoted himself, uh, that he was an intellectual of sorts, uh, that he was a graduate and, 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 and the holder of multiple degrees, even a doctorate from the venerable University of Vienna, uh, from his native uh, Austria-Hungary, and that he spoke 11 languages. Well, you know, there's something to this, but it's considerably exaggerated. You know, when, when you actually look into it, uh, yes, he did enroll in a university in Vienna, but it wasn't the University of Vienna. It was uh, a, a university, an agricultural university of lesser prestige. Uh, he didn't graduate from there. He transferred briefly uh, to the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, in, 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 of course, uh, the Austrian zone of partition Poland, uh, but he didn't graduate uh, there either. Uh, he left school to uh, go, go into wrestling, but, but the idea that he, he, he even held a PhD st stuck, and, and he promoted it himself, and it remains widely believed to this day, and you'll see this repeated um, in, um, you know, biographies of Zbyszko. But, but even so, even if, even if this was an exaggeration, and it was, uh, it still remains true that by the standards of the early 20th century, uh, when, when, when not a whole lot of uh, people, whether in the United States or elsewhere, uh, even finished high school, uh, someone like Sibishko, who, who even had uh, some uh, university education, uh, rep well, well, he was far more educated than, uh, uh, than was typical. And it is true that throughout his life, he uh, displayed a, uh, you know, a, a taste for art and culture and drama and opera. Now, uh, this picture, you know, I'm just putting this up to make sure that you're still paying attention. Uh, this is Bishko, about the same time we're talking about, uh, roughly 1910, and he is clearly au naturel, uh, apart from a strategically placed and, you know, let us admit, a uh, pretty thick rope. Now, uh, what's the point of showing this picture other than shock value? Well, you know, uh, actually, publicity still photos of wrestlers like this were not that uncommon in those days. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure it's reading too much into it, but newspaper accounts of wrestling matches uh, in the first and second decades of the 20th century, it was pretty common for them to mention that there were a fair number of women in attendance. And, you know, if you put 
this all together, it's not hard to discern the scarcely dis, uh, disguised, but still permissibly respectable lure of sex in wrestling, you know, which was a show of muscular and um, uh, scantily clad males locked in competitive uh, uh, embrace. Now, Zbyszko was a drawing card for American wrestling fans, but most American fans actually paid money to root against him. Um, you know, they saw him as, if you will, a villain. How come? Well, several reasons. One thing was there's just different styles of wrestling. And, and Zbyszko had been trained in the standard European approach to wrestling of Greco-Roman wrestling, uh, as opposed to the livelier catch-as-catch-can style that was more popular in the United States. Now, how come? Well, Greco-Roman wrestling barred holds below the waist. You were just supposed to sort of approach your opponent, and grab on to him and just sort of rustle with him. Uh, but, 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 you know, Greco-Roman wrestling matches often became prolonged, uh, sort of immobile tests of endurance between evenly matched behemoths that Americans found sort of motionless and boring. Uh, and, and, you know, Zbyszko at, at first, I mean, later on he adapted the American style, but, but at, at, at this point, you know, he used the Greco-Roman approach, and Americans complained that his style was just sort of slow and crude, and that it didn't have much style uh, or pizzazz, and that he simply used brute strength to uh, overwhelm opponents. And, you know, there were accusations that he resorted to uh, dirty tactics as well. So American fans, at least at this point, that would change later on, uh, but American fans tended to regard Zbyszko as, as I say, you know, wrestling has always sort of... Uh, you know, promoted uh, wrestlers either as quote-unquote heroes or villains. And for a lot of uh, American fans, you know, Zbyszko was a villain. Now, by the same token, on the, on the other hand, he won the hearts of Polish Americans, the American Polonia, as perhaps no other sportsmen of Polish heritage uh, before or since, you know, including even people like Stan Musial. Now, now, now uh, how, how come? Well, you know, one thing was, you know, compare Zbyszko to his contemporary, uh, an American-born but, uh, you know, Polish-American, fully Polish-American wrestler, uh, Stanley Ketchel. Uh, whose original name was Quetzal. Now, now Ketchel was a, a, a middleweight boxing champion, and he was well known, uh, and he was of Polish background, but, uh, you know, he, he didn't broadcast the fact that, that, that he was Polish. If anything, uh, he, he, he sort of tried to uh, uh, cover up his, his immigrant background. Now, now, Ketchel was quite famous. Um, he even, at one point, fought for the heavyweight crown against the great uh, uh, heavyweight uh, African-American uh, champion, uh, Jack Johnson. And, uh, you know, Ketchel was famous enough that uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, wrote a short story about him. But as I say, Ketchel, you know, didn't. Well, he, he basically tried to hide the fact that he was of Polish background. Now, 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 Zbyszko, on the other hand, uh, took the exact opposite tack. 
he 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 promoted himself as uh, Polish. Uh, he had himself announced in the ring as the mighty son of Poland, and he invited the perception that his victories in the ring were victories for the Polish cause, for the recovery of Polish independence, which was still under foreign rule at, at this time. Uh, and also, you know, Polish Americans, you know, relished the fact that in effect, when, 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 when Zbyszko won a match, uh, particularly won a match against uh, a, a, a rival who was not Polish, that he was giving comeuppance to uh, Polish American social betters, you know, the people in the United States higher than them on uh, uh, the, the, the social totem pole and who tended to look down their noses at uh, Polish Americans. So, you know, accounts are rife of, you know, Zbyszko being serenaded in the ring by Polish American fans by being presented uh, bouquets of flowers uh, in appreciation uh, of, of, of uh, Polish Americans naming their sons after him. Uh, so, you know, this, as I say, is the key to understanding Zbyszko as the quote unquote athletic ethnic hero of Polish Americans. Now, Zbyszko's exploits by 1910 uh, won him uh, a match to contest for the world championship against the holder, uh, a, a fellow named Frank Gotch. And you see here uh, uh, posters promoting the, 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 the match. And you see uh, a, a picture of Gotch himself. Now, the, Zbyszko lost uh, in his match against Gotch. And the legend has it that uh, Gotch pulled a fast one on him, that, that at the beginning of the match, as you see here in a picture that supposedly uh, represents that, uh, the, the, the two wrestlers met at the start of the match, and Gotch extended his hand as if to shake hands, and Zbyszko took his hand, and then, without warning, Gotch, uh, instead of shaking Zbyszko's hand, uh, grabbed him and threw him to the mat. Uh, now, this was an unsportsmanlike uh, uh, maneuver, uh, but it wasn't against the rules. And uh, that supposedly what happened was that this tactic uh, put Zbyszko at uh, a disadvantage that he was never able uh, to overcome. And so uh, Zbyszko lost his, um, uh, his, his chance at the world championship there. Following his defeat by Gotch, uh, Zbyszko spent the next few years uh, going back and forth between, uh, uh, United, uh, between the United States and his native Poland. Uh, you see here uh, a picture of, of, of Zbyszko uh, taken in, 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 in Poland. Uh, you see a newspaper article uh, uh, touting one of his matches. Um, and, and, and Zbyszko hoped for a rematch uh, to try to gain the, the championship in the United States, uh, but he was denied that. So uh, he, he, he went back to Europe and when World War I broke out in 1914, uh, Zbyszko was competing in Russia. And this was unfortunate for him because he, you know, Russia was uh, fighting against Austria-Hungary in World War I, and Zbyszko was a native and a subject of Austria-Hungary. And, and, and so Zbyszko was interned in Russia as an enemy alien and, 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 and forced to wrestle in Russia. Well, he did, and he went through the war in Russia, and he found himself there at the time of the Russian Revolution, 
that resulted in the transformation of Russia into the Soviet Union. And Zbyshko finally emerged from Russia in 1919 and showed up in the United States and uh, forever thereafter, throughout the rest of his life, he emerged with the tallest of tall tales that he ever told about his life. And it went something like this. And you see one example in this uh, newspaper article uh, entitled, There Was No Faking When Zbyshko Wrestled for His Life. Now, now, how did this story go? Well, uh, the way Zbyshko told it was this, that during the Russian Revolution, um, he was accused by a rival wrestler of being an enemy spy. And so he was taken into captivity by either... The, the, the Russian communists or the Russian anti-communists. He never told the same story twice, uh, it, it seemed. And he was forced to wrestle for his life. In other words, they staged a wrestling match. If Zbyshko lost, he would be executed on the spot. If Zbyshko won, then he would be given a large purse of money. Well, according to the story, Zbyshko won. He was presented with the money. He threw the money into the air so that it scattered to the wind. And at that, the entire armed guard that was surrounding him uh, immediately raced to try to catch the, 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 the Russian ruble notes that were floating through the air. In the confusion, Zbyshko was able to commandeer a running automobile handily at, uh, 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 at hand. Uh, he made his escape, crossed the Russian frontier, went into Poland, uh, which had, you know, uh, recently won its independence where he briefly served as a secret advisor to the government of Poland under the leadership of the famous pianist Ignacy Jan Paderewski. Now, this tale is completely preposterous, of course, and is easily disproved. Uh, but, but nevertheless, that didn't stop Zbyshko from telling it. And he continued to tell it uh, throughout uh, his, his career in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, this and, 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 and you know, sports American sports writers ate it up, and uh, you know, it was repeated over and over again. And you know, this wasn't the only one. I mean, I mean, Zbyshko told all sorts of stories like this uh, about. You know that, that that he was chummy with crowned heads of Europe. Uh, that he was friends with with cultural uh, luminaries in 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 Europe. You, you, you know, great writers and ballet dancers and music composers. Uh, all of it false so far as can be told. But but you know, I mean I mean, uh, wrestling did that. Right. I mean, wrestling was famous then, as it's famous now, for uh, uh, you know uh, these kinds of, 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 of fabulous stories uh, about the wrestlers, and you know, Spishko was pretty good at this uh, self-promotion, and you know that becomes part of the entertaining. Uh, uh, aspect of, 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 of the life story of Zbyshko. Now, by the time Zbyshko came back to the United States, he comes back to the United States in 1919. By this time, he is out of shape. 
He's broke. He's old. As athletes are reckoned, and he was pretty much considered a, a, a has been. But nevertheless, he announced his intention to go back into wrestling in the United in, in the United States and to contend once again for the championship. And he eventually won it, and 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 won it pretty quickly. And the way he did it is an interesting story in itself. Now, 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 one thing you see here is a picture of Zbyszko shaking hands. This time it was a real handshake. Uh, with the guy who became his most famous quote-unquote rival uh, during Zbyszko's hey, uh, heyday in the early 1920s, and that was Ed Lewis, better known as Strangler Lewis. Now, Lewis was a legendary wrestler, and, and he was the dominating uh, wrestler of his time. And he was on and off the recognized world champion. Uh, but he was a savvy businessman, too. And it was Lewis who sort of came up with the idea that, you know what wrestling could really use? You know, wrestling could, um, you know, the wrestling business might be better off if you had, you know, frequent changes in the championship. This would promote publicity. And the best way to do this was to fix the championship to predetermine the results and you know it was actually Lewis who sort of masterminded the transformation of wrestling from what it had been where, where, where fixed matches were common enough but but it was it, it, it was Lewis who sort of turned this into the basic model of professional wrestling and Lewis and the people around him decided that the storyline of this aging wrestler, this, this foreign-born wrestler who had overcome adversity, him winning the world championship would make a great and effective storyline. So. Zbyszko, quote unquote, won the championship from Lewis in 1921 in a fixed match. And this was the first of a series of matches in which Zbyszko would win and then lose and regain and then lose again the world championship in the course of four years. And this, you know, this series of matches, all of them were fixed, or at least they were planned to be fixed. Now, Spishko's hold on the world championship was relatively brief. It was a little more than a year in two stints. But during that time, he became recognized as one of the luminaries of what turned out to be a golden age of sport in the roaring 20s, the, the, the decade of the 1920s. Um, now, you know, I, I'm not saying that he was one of the, the, the foremost stars of American sport, like, you know, Babe Ruth or Red Grange or, or Big Bill Tilden or... Gene Tooney or Jack Dempsey, uh, guys like that. But he he clearly made an impression on American consciousness, uh, you know, both among sports fans. Somehow, as you'll see demonstrated, you know, in, in, in the rest of this lecture, you know, you, you know, somehow he made an impression on a lot of people as just sort of the embodiment what wrestling was supposed to be. He just looked 
the part of a wrestler, and they remembered him for that. But also, he clearly made an impression on American consciousness uh, simply beyond the realm of sport. Uh, for instance, um, you know, he became wrestling champion in 1921, and in 1922, uh, the, the, the famous American dramatist, Eugene O'Neill, uh, mentions Bishko in uh, his, his play entitled uh, The Harry Eight. Now, now, what was Bishko's appeal? You, you know, now, by and large, he was seen by sports fans as a more sympathetic figure. Remember that the, the old Bishko had, had, had been seen as a bad guy, as a villain. Uh, but now, you know, his appeal was that he was the old man of wrestling. He was old zip. And he was a venerable figure who defied expectation uh, by staying at the top of his game uh, despite the advance of years. And you, you can see that in this, this, this poster here. You know, this Bishko as the grand old man of the map uh, against Oscar Nyblin, the Swedish giant was actually, you know, bigger than Zbyshko. Now, now, how did Zbyshko do this? Uh, now, well, well, he became famous for clean living and for staying in top shape through a healthy diet and rigorous exercise. Uh, he and his brother, uh, he had a brother named Vladislav, uh, who was also a wrestler, uh, billed himself as Vladik Zbyshko. Uh, Noted wrestler, never quite as famous as uh, his older brother uh, Stanislaus, uh, but uh, together they bought uh, a, a house on, on the main coast in Old Orchard Beach, and you see that in the upper left-hand corner of the slide with the brothers Bishko in, in, in lower left, and um, they used this as a house and a training center. Uh, and it was there that Zbyshko would uh, work out daily and swim in the Atlantic and um, also hosted and, and trained uh, with other athletes, such as uh, up here in, in, in the upper right, uh, you see Zbyshko with the uh, famous heavyweight boxing champion, uh, Jack Dempsey. Now, uh, although by now he uh, had, had brought a repeal to uh, uh, American sports fans in general, he remained a, a particular hero to uh, Polish Americans. And you can see that in this uh, slide here. Uh, you, you see the interior of a tavern and a billiard parlor on uh, the, the largely Polish south side of Milwaukee in 1921, probably 1921, it seems. And of course, that was the year that Zbyszko won the world championship. And in the upper right, uh, you can see a blow up of uh, a, a poster uh, that, that you see on the wall of the tavern in the larger photograph that, that says Zbyszko, uh, world champion wrestler. Now, Zbyszko's hold on the championship, as I mentioned earlier, was brief, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it had largely been given to him by Strangler Lewis, and what Strangler Lewis uh, could give, Strangler Lewis could also uh, take away. And by 1922, Lewis and his associates uh, decided that it was time for Zbyszko to uh, hand back the championship to him. And uh, so he did, or was uh, required uh, to do so. And also, uh, Zbyszko was forced to lose repeatedly in a series of rematches uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, now, um, I can't prove it or anything like that. You know, you know one thing was that, that you know, the fixing of matches was, was, was sort of a, a somewhat open secret, but, you know, you weren't supposed to talk about it.
and you weren't supposed to admit it in public. But if you look into it closely, you just get the idea that Spishko's idea about this was that, you know, he was kind of sort of okay with fixed matches as long as it benefited him. But, you know, it was the thing you had to do, you know, giving him the benefit of the doubt, let's say. Uh, but when it worked against him, he resented it highly. And he got his revenge. In 1925, uh, Lewis decided to hand over the championship to the guy you see here on the right. And his name was Wayne Munn better known as Big Munn. Now, Munn wasn't a wrestler. He had no wrestling background or chops to speak of at all. Uh, he was a former well-known, he, he, he had been a college football player, and he was well-known, he was photogenic. So uh, the Lewis interest decided, okay, it's Munn's turn. And, 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 and so Munn becomes champion. And it is arranged that Zbyshko is going to have a couple of matches against Munn. He was supposed to lose both of them. And he did lose the first one. But legend has it that when they went into the ring the second time, Zbyshko looked at Munn and said, all right, this time we wrestle for real. And thereupon, Zbyshko simply destroyed Mud and beat him so badly that um, uh, the, 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 the women fainted at ringside, beat him so badly that the referee who was in on the fix had no choice but to award Zbyshko the victory and with it, the world's championship. This went down in uh, wrestling lore as the most famous double cross of a fixed match uh, in the entire annals of the sport. Now, 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 Zbyshko, after beating Munn and becoming world champion, thereupon, quote unquote, lost a match and with it, the championship to a friendly rival in what appears to have been uh, the completion of a prearranged deal in this sort of war of competing uh, groups in the, the sort of wrestling underworld. Now, again, I can't prove it, but you put two and two together and it really looks as if Zbyshko paid for this maneuver by essentially being blackballed from the highest levels of wrestling thereupon. He found it harder and harder to get matches. He never again was given a chance at the world championship. Uh, you even had a couple of states that refused to recognize his victory over Munn and continue to recognize Munn as world champion. Uh, and, and the irony is that now the excuse that promoters gave for, for not giving Sabishko matches was that he was too old. This after, you know, that, that was his big appeal <laughs> up until then, right? He was the old guy. Uh, who, who still managed to uh, uh, beat opponents. Now, after this, his career as a wrestler began to go into decline. And for the rest of his life, he tended to make more news outside the ring than in. And the first of these is a very curious incident. And that is that in 1929, the widely read newspaper, The New York American, wrote a story and it said, look, look, we're going to prove the truth of 
the theory of evolution. And in doing this, it ran a picture of Zbyszko and a gorilla and said, look at these two and you can see a clear resemblance that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not using the exact words, but says uh, the, the, the wrestler Zbyszko uh, doesn't look, doesn't look much like much advanced over a gorilla. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, not surprisingly, Zbyszko took umbrage at this and filed suit for libel and said, look, you can't do this. In the first place, you know, it's irresponsible. I am a graduate of the famous University of Vienna. You will remember that he actually was not a graduate of the University of Vienna, but never mind. Furthermore, he went on, this article had destroyed his marriage because his wife, humiliated by the comparison of her husband to a gorilla, now shunned him and would not return his affection. And so uh, he, he, he filed suit uh, against the New York American. And you can see that um, uh, described in, in, in the story from Time Magazine as Bishko versus Ape. Uh, now you'll notice if you have time to read this, that, that Time itself is, is having some fun with this and is sort of saying, well, there may be something too. Yeah, you, 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 you know, saying that Zbyszko looks uh, a little bit like a gorilla. But nevertheless, in the end, Zbyszko won. Uh, you know, he, he retained the famous uh, 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 civil uh, liberties lawyer, Arthur Garfield Hayes, uh, who was one of the founders of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, he defended uh, Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, he was a big deal in the legal world. And, and, and you know, he, he signed on as Bishko's lawyer and uh, Zbyszko won, and he won a pretty large uh, settlement. And as, as Hayes told it, um, uh, you know, in an article later, he said, you know, I, I didn't expect to win, or, you know, I didn't expect to, to get this large a settlement. But, you know, the secret was that Zbyszko went on the stand, and he proved so charming and endearing a witness uh, that he won over the jury uh, and, 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 and got this verdict uh, beyond my wildest dreams. Now, uh, despite his victory in court uh, over, uh, you know, I, I, I should say that, that this case, Zbyszko versus New York American, uh, you know, it's often cited in uh, uh, you know American libel law case, and you, you'll see it talked about in argument, in, 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 in articles, and law books, and and, and and things like that. So you know, Bishko kind of makes his contribution uh, to the uh, to the to the evolution of American law. Now, uh, despite his victory in Bishko versus New York American. Uh, his life thereafter seemed to go into a tailspin. Uh, for one thing, he was found guilty in a lawsuit brought against him for a breach of promise to marry, which may suggest that the cooling of his wife's affections uh, had more to do uh, had to do with more than. Uh, simply a, a, a defamatory newspaper article, right? Uh, he went bankrupt, uh, you know, as a result of having to pay this settlement and the failure of his investments in the Great Depression. Uh, he tried to revive his wrestling career in Argentina, 
uh, but the government there threatened to confiscate any winnings uh, for failure to pay back taxes. Uh, he retired from the ring at age 57. Uh, he tried his hand at promoting matches uh, in Poland and Argentina uh, with mixed results. And then on top of everything else, a fire destroyed part of his property in Maine. And he departed with his brother uh, for, for uh, rural Missouri and uh, left his estranged wife to manage uh, what was left of his property uh, on the Atlantic coast. Now, Zbyszko, this happened in 1938, and Zbyszko lived uh, with his brother Vladek uh, in, in, in sort of nowhere Missouri uh, for over 10 years in total oblivion until out of nowhere, he was hired to appear in a movie, uh, a, a film noir that appeared in 1950 uh, called Night and the City. And it, this, this is a real interesting story, if you ask me, and it goes something like this. Uh, the director, Jules Dassin, um, he, he was going to make this movie, and he needed to cast the part, uh, you know, a key supporting role uh, of a retired champion wrestler. And he didn't want an actor. He, he, he wanted a, a real wrestler. And he, he told Daryl Zanuck, who was the producer of the movie, and he said, you know, uh, gee, you know, I... I, I, I I want to find somebody, you know, I remember this wrestler from a long time ago. He, he, he was this Polish guy, and he, he, he was perfect for it. But, you know, nobody's heard of him. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's long dead. And, and, you know, one thing leads to another, and, 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 and Dassin finds out, no. Uh, he, he's not dead. He's he's still alive. Uh, but we got to find him. And Dassin did. And even though he'd never made him, he hired he, he, you know he hired Zbyszko and recruited him to play the part of Gregorius the Great. Now now what was the storyline of Night and the City? Well. Uh, it was a vehicle for Richard Widmark, whom you see here. Uh, you, you see Widmark on the left. And, and uh, Widmark plays uh, a crooked wrestling promoter. And, and uh, to, to uh, promote his business, he wants a plausible front man, right? And so what he does is he hires... Gregorius the Great. And that was the part that Zbyszko played. And who was Gregorius the Great? Well, Gregorius the Great was a famous wrestler from the good old days when wrestling was a legitimate sport. And uh, Widmark hired Gregorius, you know, Gregorius didn't know what was going on, right? He thought that Widmark was on the level and, and, and wanted him for his genuine wrestling expertise. And, and so Gregorius, played by Zbyszko, is to be the sort of respectable front man for this operation running fixed matches. Well, Gregorius kind of slowly catches on and tensions rise, and, and, and Zbyszko's big scene uh, comes towards the end of the movie when, you know, no spoilers here, but um, the tensions build and they erupt in a spontaneous grudge wrestling match between Zbyszko's elderly Gregorius and the syndicate's prize sham wrestler. And, you know, Zbyszko literally goes down fighting 
in defense of the integrity of his sport. Now, now, Night in the City was roundly panned by critics when it came out, although, you know, now it's, it's, it's found some supporters among um, uh, fans of uh, film noir. But even at the time, Zbyszko's amateur performance was praised as the high point of the film. Uh, Bosley Crowther, uh, the well-known movie critic for the New York Times called him uh, the, the magnificent old champ. And, and, you know, the thing was that, you know, what they did was they sort of saw Zbyszko playing Gregorius the Great, and they saw him as actually having been a Gregorius the Great in real life. You know, he was the honest, upstanding, genuine wrestling champion when, as we know, the story was, um, shall we say, a little more complicated than that. But that was the story that stuck. And, 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 and this was repeated, you know, almost, uh, you know, decades later. In, in, in 2008, the famous uh, American playwright, David Mamet, uh, had an article in the New York Times where he was recalling some of his favorite movies about boxing. And he talked about Zbyszko in Night and the City. And, you, you know, you can, you, you can see quotations from uh, the Mamet article here. Um, you know, you, you know a beautiful death scene. Well, okay. Uh, uh, I gave away the story there. Uh, played by a man who never acted uh, before. And, and, and Mamet goes on to praise Zbyszko and says he was the real deal. You could see it in his face. This was the tragic face of wisdom. Well, Zbyszko returned to Missouri after making Night and the City, but in effect, what Night and the City did was to transform him in the public mind as Gregorius the Great, and he kept playing that role for the rest of his life. Uh, Arthur Daly, uh, the well-known sports columnist for the New York Times, uh, wrote repeatedly about him as, you know, a hero of wrestling. Back in the day when wrestling was a real sport, he had been uh, the, 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 the champion of wrestling and, 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 and talked about him as a, a, a spokesman for, for, for genuine wrestling. And he opened his columns to Zbyszko himself. Uh, to write about his his career and and to decry uh, the, the the degradation of wrestling and 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 the scandal of fixed matches and 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 things such as that yeah, yeah. Uh, you could say well this was simply rank hypocrisy right because yeah, you know we know the real story about Spishko. Uh, we know that he knew better than that, uh, that, you know, he, he, he'd been in his share of fixed matches. But, you know, if you think about it, you could almost see how Zbyszko could spin this story uh, the way he was trying to tell it. You know, one could see how he might convince himself in his own mind that he kind of was Gregorius the Great. After all, like Gregorius, uh, he had been brought up in the classic Greco-Roman style. You know, he hadn't invented fixing. You know, this had been forced upon him. And you could almost see Zbyszko telling himself that, 
in my own way, I struck a blow against the fixing of matches. I, I, I pretty much exposed their sham champ, Big Monk, the way that Gregorius the Great uh, exposed the sham champ in, in uh, Night and the City. And then, like Gregorius, I paid for that by being blackballed from the sport and sort of cast out of its good graces again. I can't prove that, but just the way that Svishko would speak about his career, and he would complain about the fixing of matches, and, 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 and mourn for the lost innocence of wrestling, you can almost see how he would tell this story in a way that cast himself as, if you will, one of wrestling's true heroes, as opposed to to being one of its adults. Well, Zbyszko died in 1967, aged either 86 or 88, depending on which version of Zbyszko's own autobiography uh, you believe. As I mentioned, you know, he never told the same story twice uh, about his life. And all the obituaries could have been written about Gregorius the Great, right? Uh, they described him as the embodiment of the good old days of wrestling. And they repeated as fact uh, many of the legends that he himself had concocted and spread and popularized and repeated uh, about his life. And that many people, to the extent they know anything about Svishko, uh, they believe to this day. Now, although Zbyszko was the one sportsman of Polish birth or extraction who can be said to have enjoyed widespread renown on both sides of the Atlantic, um, he is little remembered today. Wrestling aficionados recall him as one of the handful of the top grapplers of his era, but, well, I mean, you see here, but otherwise you don't hear about it much, right? And you see here the unveiling of a monument to him, a statue, uh, in his hometown of, of, of Jodłowa, in what's now southern Poland, in, in, in 2014. Uh, but but that, that was done um, expressly for the purpose of uh, the town father said, rescuing the memory, uh, the unjustly forgotten memory of, of, of the proudest, proud son of Jodłowa. Now he was the inspiration for a 1979 Polish film, uh, Aria dla Atlete, uh, Aria for an Athlete, uh, directed by Philippe Bayon, based loosely but recognizably on the life of Zbyszko as a circus strongman uh, turned acclaimed and globetrotting wrestler with a fondness for the arts and the finer things of life. Well, how to sum it up? It seems fitting that the wrestler who played a fictionalized character resembling himself in one movie would have his own history fictionally retold in another. Because the whole picaresque life of the man who called himself Stanislaw Spishko was in a, in a sense kind of lived on the margins where fact met fiction so that they became nearly impossible to tell apart. He was a jumble of contradictions and self-manufactured legends. A Polish patriot who lived most of his many years by choice in the United States or elsewhere abroad. An athlete who gained his two championship laurels once by accepting victory in a fixed match and once by breaking a deal to fix another. But won a reputation 
as a symbol of sporting integrity, a man of genuine intellect and breeding and adventure who systematically exaggerated or falsified his exploits. Yet, nevertheless, he possessed an aura of rough authenticity that could persuade a succession of distinguished observers, such as Eugene O'Neill, Jules Dassin, Arthur Daly, Bosley Crowther, that he was, as David Mamet put it, the real deal, or so they thought. In fact, when you come right down to it, the most real thing about Zbyszko was that he was, an, he was an expert performer who could make not just a fixed wrestling bout, but his entire biography, a convincing simulation of reality. He may have made only one movie, but he spent a lifetime playing the role of the mighty Zbyszko. Well, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it, found it instructive, and see you next time.